Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar presentation, Problem Solving in Healthcare, How to Teach the Mindset, Method, and Tools for the Capstone, Internships, Case Competitions, and Beyond, presented by Springer Publishing Company and featuring Dr. Sandra Potoff and Justine Meshek, authors of the newly published textbook, Applied Problem Solving in Healthcare Management. My name is David Diodana, and I am the senior editor responsible for the health administration and public health publishing programs here at Springer Publishing. For those who do not know much about Springer Publishing Company, we are an independent publisher known for innovative textbooks, professional references, and clinical products in the fields of nursing, behavioral and health sciences, and medicine. Before we begin, please note that this webinar will be recorded, disseminated, and posted on our website in case you miss any part of the presentation. And we will also be taking a few questions at the end of the presentation from the audience and through the Q&A feature on Zoom. Please feel free to send along any questions as we go during the presentation itself. We also welcome feedback for how we did at the conclusion of this webinar. So please fill out the brief survey at the end. And if you have time or would like to. And now I'm delighted to hand over the presentation to Sandra and Justine. Please take it away. Thanks so much, David. Uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, my name is Sandy Potoff. I just recently retired after 30 years in health administration and public health. I spent the bulk of my career at the University of Minnesota and then the last three years of my career at the University of South Florida. And while I was at uh, the University of Minnesota, uh, taught the problem solving course or was involved in the capstone for about 25 years and I also was the MHA program director for eight years. I'd like to welcome you all to the seminar today. Hello everyone, my name is Justine Mishek and I'm a graduate of the Minnesota MHA program from 2002. Sandy Potoff or Dr. Potoff was my mentor while I was in uh, school and I was her TA for the problem solving method and here I am back in the program teaching students uh, the method and facilitating our experiential learning process in the MHA program. Thanks for joining today. And I would also like to add that Greg Hart is a third author who is not on uh, with us today but he is a 1976 graduate of the University of Minnesota MHA program and has been involved in mentoring students uh, in this course, the course that we teach based on the method uh, since he graduated. So there's a long history uh, of, of the three of us authors being involved in the problem solving method. As a, before we talk about the agenda, I would first just like to recognize all of the hard work that all, all of you in academics and health administration are doing uh, during this pandemic um, to see how the healthcare system is rising to the challenge of just the surge of demand that they have is a testament to all the hard work uh, that all of you have done over the years. So a big shout out and thank you to all of you who have helped educate the generation of leaders that is helping us get through this. Um, for the agenda, we're going to just briefly talk about the history of the problem solving method and why Justine and Greg and I uh, wrote the book, uh, take you on a tour of the text and the tools, and then talk a little bit about how you might integrate uh, the problem solving method into your curriculum and then leave some time at the end for questions and answers. But first we'd like to take a poll and just find out uh, for those of you who are on today, uh, what organization are you affiliated with? So if you can uh, select all that apply because we know these are not uh, mutually exclusive categories, please let us know uh, if you're in a health administration program. And then if you are uh, also indicate whether you're in a business school, allied health, public health, and so on, we'd appreciate it. Great, so it looks like almost half of you are in uh, a health administration program, a large chunk of you in public health as well as business schools. 
and some folks from a healthcare delivery organization as well as other. Uh, so thank you all for being here today and we hope you have some good questions for us uh, as you listen. So just a bit of background about the problem solving method. So this is a picture of the first class of the University of Minnesota and actually the method has been taught since its inception in 1946. And so it has a long history, but it has always been uh, improved every year that it's been taught. And speaking of that, here is a picture of Greg Hart. Uh, a faculty member that has taught the problem solving method alongside Sandy and myself meeting with students and throughout the years we've iterated the problem solving method. Uh, it started as 14 steps and now it's three phases um, with uh, multiple steps within each phase and we've updated the documentation and the module that we have for students and we've really thought that um, it was time to re bring this back to light after Hamilton had articulated his 14 steps 50 years ago. We wanted to, in light of the 75th anniversary of the MHA program in Minnesota, write down where we are right now with the method um, and share it with the community. It's, I would say especially because we've had so, a lot of requests over the years from folks um, at different universities. So I've told people this is my capstone. <laughs> All right, the other thing we'd like to know as we move forward is, are you teaching any problem solving methods currently in your curriculum? And if so, which ones? If you could just select all that are applicable to your curriculum. So it looks like a lot of you are using the PDSA. Uh, and then next is Lean Six Sigma. Um, other methods, there's a, a number of you that are thinking about um, planning on adopting a method. So it's good to see that there's some structured um, approaches that are being used. And what you'll see um, when you look at the text after the webinar, um, if you purchase a copy, is that the, the problem solving method we have is actually complementary to these methods. It is not a competitor. Uh, and it fits well with any of the types of problem solving methods that you are currently using. So why did we write this book? Uh, Sandy approached me almost a year and a half, two years ago, wondering if I wanted to collaborate on uh, documenting our uh, method and then providing tools um, back to uh, MHA programs, other academic programs and industry. And in thinking about the importance of the book right now, um, and always, we really wanted to tap into ensuring that our healthcare leaders and teams can effectively problem solve in our rapidly changing environments. We think of COVID right now and how problem solving is ever more important um, amongst various stakeholder viewpoints. Uh, we want to ensure that we're teaching the method of stakeholder analyses and considering all viewpoints. Uh, interprofessional team-based approaches, um, implicit and structural bias, as well as, as the tendency to jump to solutions. So really in writing the book, we're looking to dive into these topics and help students who are very overwhelmed young in their career or professionals who may be overwhelmed with the pace of change um, to problem solve in team environments and in environments where they're different stakeholder viewpoints. So really this is uh, a, a text that, that helps students as well as um, experienced professionals really learn how to define study uh, and solve problems. And the little logo we chose that's on the front of the book as well as on the right hand side of the uh, slide here is meant to convey a very important part of problem solving. And that is the importance of engaging in divergent thinking, which you see on the left-hand side of the logo, is that you really have to expand your thinking out uh, and then really study and engage in order to then converge 
onto a solution that addresses all parts of the problem. Because especially uh, people who don't have a lot of experience, they might see something that just seems like a big mess and they don't know how to get their arms around the big mess. And so they'll pick just one or two things. Well, one or two things might not really fix what really is the mess of the problem. And a really um, famous organizational uh, theorist, Russell Acoff, talks about managers don't really solve problems, they manage messes. Well, at the end of the day, you have to solve the problem, but how do you solve it in a way that really is able to get your arms around the mess? And so this is an approach that um, we have found really help students as well as um, folks who have uh, more experience be able to do that. But uh, what we find in, in research on problem solving is that divergent thinking is not automatic. Uh, one of the biggest things that you see in, in problem solving researchers who study problem solving is there's a tendency to just jump to a solution. You don't really understand what the problem is you just define the, the problem as a solution that you want to implement. Well, that clearly isn't going to get you to the, you know, the crux of the issue that really needs to be resolved. And so that's why we really like this quote uh, by Dwight D. Eisenhower is that you have to try and make the problem bigger um, because then you can start to see the outlines of a solution. But the issue, you know, the question is, well, how big is big enough? And so I think the first part to think, to recognize for problem solving approaches is you really need something that helps people engage in divergent thinking. What this also does is, is um, helps you make sure that you're solving the right problem because the problem will have a number of components and you really have to make sure you understand and research all of those components. And so another great quote from Russell Acoff is that most of the time uh, when people fail, it's because they solved the wrong problem. It's not because they got the wrong solution to the right problem. So you really want an approach that helps avoid this uh, premature convergent thinking. Throughout the define, study, and act phases of the problem solving method, the Minnesota way of problem solving and what we talk about in this textbook is the mindset of never assume. And that goes along the lines of making sure that our students and others that are problem solvers are considering uh, facts and opinions that are beyond the scope of their availability. So the never assume mindset helps avoid availability bias, which is a type of bias we talk about in the text and in class, where you're only considering what you know. Another type of bias that the method helps avoid is confirmation bias. And this is really what Sandy was talking about, that we as humans have a tendency to jump to a solution and perhaps only look at the data that proves that that solution is the best solution. So by having a method and a way to define problems and study problems and also consider how you're communicating the recommendations in the ACT phase, uh, that can help with confirmation bias. So let's take a brief tour of the text and the tools. So starting out, this is the method. Uh, the problem solving method. And you can see it has three phases, the define phase, the study phase, and the act phase. And then within each of those phases, there are a set of steps and sub steps underneath them. Now, as we talked about these, uh, the importance of divergent and convergent thinking, the define phase takes, the, takes you through the first wave of divergent thinking where you have to engage with your stakeholders and really understand the problem from their point of view. So you really are, diver it's divergent in that you're really collecting a lot of information in the beginning to make sure you understand the situation uh, without passing any judgment uh, about who's telling you what, you're just you know, really trying to find out what the facts are and then you converge uh, 
using a method that we call grouping difficulties into problem areas and write, writing issue statements for each of those problem areas and then summarizing those to converge on a problem statement. So that's your first wave of divergent and convergent thinking. Then in the study phase, you have to look at each problem area that you identified and again brainstorm using divergent thinking to generate a whole range of possible root causes as well as a whole range of potential alternative solutions. So that starts your second wave of divergent thinking. And then you have to go out and collect research and judge what you're finding against the criteria that you're using to judge the alternative solutions in order to converge on a set of conclusions um, leading to the ACT phase for the recommendations. And then in the ACT phase, you really need to pay attention to how do you engage with the stakeholders to make sure that your recommendations actually get implemented, and then how do you monitor to make sure they're having their intended impact. So there are two waves of divergent and convergent thinking followed by a phase that really uh, forces you to focus on your key stakeholders and how to tell your message so that your recommendations actually get implemented. So the text is structured around the problem solving method. So there are five uh, sections to the uh, text. And the first uh, section is the mindset and the method. So it starts out talking about the never assume mindset, uh, divergent and convergent thinking. Uh, and then the second chapter is a self-contained chapter of a description of the method that you just saw in its entirety. And then the third chapter compares and contrasts uh, the method and how it is complementary to uh, lean as well as design thinking. And then a fourth chapter in that first part uh, that uh, lays out based on the National Center for Healthcare Leadership Framework, what are the different leadership competencies that using the problem solving method will imbue into your students? So that's the first uh, part of the text. Then the next uh, three parts are, are designed so that students can work through the case that is introduced in, ch in chapter one called the spinal frontier. And so within each of those parts, there are, there's a chapter for each step in that part as well as uh, an answer key so that students can work through the um, method. Uh, and it also is useful if you wanna work through in class also. And then the last part of the text has um, a set of cases that are more quality and operations based, and there's five of those, and then five cases that are more strategy based. And then we have two really um, much longer population health cases that are really useful for example, for case competitions. And then for those of you who are in long-term care, we also have an operations and strategy based um, cases for uh, the long-term care uh, arena. When we were discussing writing the book, we thought that the textbook and the chapters will be very helpful and the Spinal Frontier case will help students and faculty learn the method. Although we realized that we had to likely provide more tools um, in order for students to, who feel overwhelmed to facilitate the method um, and for faculty to be able to really evaluate the student's work uh, as well as uh, provide deliverables. And if you were to create a problem solving course or if you were to fit this into your management strategy capstone or internship courses, these tools can serve as deliverables on your syllabi and you can evaluate the student or team's success in problem solving through a case or a real life situation. Um, so, you know, the, the first um, tool, the problem area summary table um, is very important because this is where students will, will define the problem. So here you can evaluate as an instructor if the students are on the right track in defining their problem and look out for things such as solutions, 
in the problem statement and also if the problem statement is merely just a research question. So these tools will help you evaluate and in our instructor's manual online, um, we have some tips on evaluation as well. A few examples to review. Uh, here is the abbreviated stakeholder analysis table. And this is one of the first steps in the define stage where you're considering the problem as it's viewed by each stakeholder. And here the students are looking at the possible root causes and suggested alternative solutions from the various stakeholders that are a part of or impacted by the, by the problem or the situation stated. And then from there, um, the students are really looking at all the difficulties in the case, grouping them into a problem area uh, so that themes start to emerge and problem areas are defined um, and student teams can then research each problem area and come up with alternative solutions and conclusions for each problem area. Another example that's in the study phase of the problem solving method is what we call the de decision criteria matrix. And this is very helpful for students to understand how to select alternative solutions. So each criteria that an organization or a problem presents um, can be established through research in the student teams. And then as they discover alternative solutions for a problem area, they can list them on the left and create their framework, their decision-making framework, and then move to table 2.5, which really actually has them place their research into a logic framework where then they can, um, as a team or individually, judge the pros and cons of each alternative solution and decide if it should be accepted or not. Sandy, is there anything else you'd want to add on the tools before we move on to the next section? I think I would just make sure to highlight that all the tools would, are downloadable from Springer Connect for both faculty as well as students so that they can work in those tools as frameworks. Um, what you find is students, when you even for the cases where, where they have to go out and do actual research and talk to different people um, it's part of the process where they have to develop the research plan, what questions are they going to ask, who are they going to ask them of, what website should they be looking at, what articles should they be reading, and students can tend to get just really overwhelmed the first time they do this because they are having to do some higher order Bloom's taxonomy thinking around not just looking at facts but trying to synthesize and integrate what they're learning uh, and then state the facts for each alternative relative to what they're learning about that alternative relative to what should be used to, to judge the alternatives. Um, and then lay all those out factually uh, and then look at that and say, okay, based on what I see in my table, what do I think are the pros and cons? What do I think are the strengths and weaknesses? So that ability to take information from a lot of different sources, sort through it, synthesize it, and integrate it is really a key piece of this um, study phase of the problem solving method that tools like this really help um, students with that process. And you can see uh, from the list a couple slides earlier, there are also a lot of other tools. So um, there's really tools for each for just about each step of the problem solving method and some tools get used in multiple places. So the stakeholder analysis, for example, you start right off the bat, uh, but then you come back to it when you're generating uh, alternative, potential alternative solutions. You come back to it again when you're thinking about, okay, who are the stakeholders and how do I sell the recommendations? So it's not just the tools and, you know, go to it. We really help, um, in, in the text as well as in the uh, instructor's manual, kind of how to use these as you work your way through the, the problem solving method. The other thing that I'll add is if you think of a field project, a capstone, or even a case competition, these tools become the students working papers, um, just as if you were on a project with a team or in a consulting firm. And the deliverable, the presentation is really 
the summation of everything the students have learned. So they're not presenting the problem solving method in each step in the lingo. They're using these tools and the method so that they can land at a place where they can determine their presentation strategy, um, augment it for the organization or the audience. Um, and at, they're at that point kind of using the problem solve or not kind of, they're using the problem solving method to guide their presentation. They're not actually presenting these tools to a client. Okay, so uh, we spent, you know, at the University of Minnesota, we have had this as a standalone course, the problem solving course since its inception. And we recognize that that might not be um, what a lot of you can do, at least in the short term in your uh, curriculum. Uh, so in the instructor's manual, we've laid out uh, some example full semester course syllabi for how you could integrate this into your capstone or summer residency or internship uh, class, uh, because we know those are things that all um, pro programs will likely have as well as laid out if you teach it as a full semester problem solving standalone course uh, what that would could look like and so we don't just say look here's the syllabi we recognize that a lot of you may not have taught problem solving and so the instructor's manual really does give a lot of detail on tips on how to teach the method uh, how to and where to use the tools as deliverables for your project-based courses uh, as well as providing for the faculty, for the cases that are in the textbook, we have uh, written out, you know, what the difficulties are, uh, what you might see as likely problem areas, as well as issue statements. So it's, it's the faculty cheat sheet, if you will, uh, for using those cases as you uh, teach. And um, some initial discussions that we've had with faculty around the text. Uh, some have said, gee, you know what, I think as I look at this, the defined phase might really look like what I would want to cover in my management course, whereas when I get to the study and act phases, that looks like something that uh, would be more applicable in the strategy course. So there are ways that you can think about integrating this either into a capstone or into uh, case-based courses you may have, or if you're offering uh, uh, case competition courses to get students ready for case competitions, uh, there are a lot of different options uh, besides a full semester problem solving course. So this is, oh, go ahead, Justine. So this is an example of what Sandy's talking about is throughout the instructor's manual, um, we have uh, samples, um, schedules for different types of courses that outline the readings, the deliverables, um, and uh, the teachings of the week. We tried to provide as detailed as possible based on what we know about teaching the method in a full semester course, and then also what we know about teaching the method in other types of formats, either embedded in a course or as a short course. Uh, so we thought that this would be helpful if you're considering uh, the textbook, um, you can, these will all be available to you um, in the teaching package. The other thing that we describe in chapter four of the text is how um, it, the method addresses competencies. And so we use the National Center for Healthcare Leadership Competency Model as an example, uh, but um, you can see that teaching the method um, really touches on, and a lot of them in great detail, the different competencies of, of the um, NCHL model. And so we um, expect that that, dis that chapter will help describe um, for you how, you know, we recognize that each program has their own competency model, but hopefully that gives you some ideas about what competencies are covered as you teach uh, the method. Um, the other thing that uh, the chapter talks about, which I think is helpful for a lot of younger students who 
might not appreciate the soft skills of leadership so much as the hard skills of learning Excel and uh, some of those other things is, is just really laying out for a student how important the quote soft skills are. Because we know the soft skills really are the hard skills. Um, and that's what I like about a lot of the competency models is they really address some of these core leadership competencies that we need um, to really uh, push the field forward. And so um, we wanted to just make sure that you could see that um, some thought has been given to help you be able to think about how this fits or may fit into your competency model. So the third question that we'd like to ask is, um, based on what you've learned today, are there particular courses in your program that you think would benefit from ad adopting the textbook uh, that we have written, Applied Problem Solving in Healthcare Management? Great, so it looks like it's, uh, it's some good feedback around clearly the internship, the capstone and uh, strategy class although a lot of you look like you're shy. Um, maybe only one person responded, I don't know. But in any case, um, we would love, you know, if you're thinking about adopting the text and would want to um, speak with us, just, uh, you know, we'd, we'd be happy to help you think through, um, you know, how you might be able to adopt the text if you, um, are having some, you know, want some ideas about how you might want to do that. The other oh. thing I'll just add too is one thing, one piece of feedback we received from uh, preceptors around the capstone and the internship is that our students using the problem solving method, because we do require it as part of the summer internship and capstone, really know how to start their project because they have a method they can start their stakeholder analysis right away. They know to ask the question, okay, um, who would be best to meet with to learn about their experience? And then they know how to drive that into problem areas and then to um, research the different alternative solutions. So just wanting to note that I think it also benefits the relationship between the program, the curriculum, alumni and industry. So just to close, um, our formal part of the presentation is that uh, there clearly is a need. Uh, you know, we all talk about how the field is changing so rapidly that, you know, X amount of what you teach uh, in terms of content might be obsolete within five to 10 years of students' um, careers. Uh, but the one thing that is going to always be needed is the ability to identify a problem and solve it and be able to pick out what are the key issues, um, know who to bring into the process uh, because good problem solving will never ever go out of date. So with that, we'd like to open it up to any questions folks may have or comments. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Justine. Um, we will now be addressing the questions that were sent through the Q&A feature um, in Zoom, as well as any questions you have that come to mind during this Q&A session. So please keep sending them if you have more um, or would like to ask the authors a question about the book um, or the method. Um, so one, the first question, Sandy and Justine, is um, about long-term care. Can you address where that is um, placed in the book? We didn't mentioned in the polling question at the beginning, which is probably my oversight, but um, can you address where you address long-term care? Yes, uh, so uh, this is Sandy. The, the method really is applicable um, across different uh, organizations, um, but what we wanted to make sure that we did was had cases that are specific to long-term care uh, even though there are some of the other ones that also uh, can be related as you think about trying to put together things for a continuum of care. Um, but I would recommend looking at uh, the, you know, going through the method and then looking at the example used for the case, uh, the spinal frontier, 
and then looking at the um, cases, the two cases specific to long-term care um, in the back. And I think one of the population health cases would also be useful. But then also, as you look at the structure of how the cases are written, is it gives you ideas about um, how you can write new cases that, because the cases, most of them are no, no more than a couple of pages long. Um, and they're just great teaching uh, tools. And what you find is students as they go out and do their summer residencies or their capstone projects is they get excited to say, hey, you know what, based on the project that we did, we want to write a case, you know, you fictionalize it, but then they write cases um, to help support uh, you know, the development of new cases. So um, I would say take a look at the two cases uh, in the part five of the text uh, that are specific to long-term care. Great, thank you. And there's a related question about the cases that I thought we'd bring up now. Um, are the cases detailed enough to be used for a project-based learning course? You mentioned there are a couple pages, but maybe go into that and if it's applicable. Do you want to take that one, Justine? Yeah, I think that um, the way that we cascade, I would say you may want what you would may want to think about using more than one case. Reason being is the way that we cascade the casework in the first year is we use the operational cases first. They're a bit shorter to learn the method. And then we have students um, look at the, a second case, which is a strategic case, and those are more involved and take a, a longer amount of time to research. The cases do not have heavy uh, financials or operational stats in them. Um, they more present the problem areas, and this, it's up to the students to go and research uh, the problem areas, the, alter the root causes and alternative solutions. And that can take quite a bit of time in a strategic case, particularly like in our instance, we make sure students are interviewing alumni and industry to solve the case. So in short, I'd, I think one case would, would not be enough. I think you'd wanna look at two and maybe three cases. Um, and just to be clear, so even though the cases are shorter, the way it's structured is that uh, when it gets to that study phase, the students are actually expected to go study. So they're expected to identify who can I speak with, uh, what, how do I find uh, good information, uh, research that's been done in this area, what are best practices. So that study phase, uh, we usually allocate about, uh, I don't know, two or three weeks uh, per case for the students to work through that. And one of the things we've uh, have done at the University of Minnesota because we were blessed with having so many alumni is we give them the alumni directory and say, okay, you know, uh, here's a place to start. Uh, but the students learn how to become self-directed to figure out who's the chief nursing officer at such and such organization. And, um, you know, and what's amazing is people love to help students. And even though folks are busy, they tend to call them back. And I know, uh, like in the Clarion case competitions, there was one year where the student was just flabbergasted. She said, the chief nursing officer talked with me for two hours one night, and then she called me back first thing the next morning because she said there were some other things I should probably know. You know, so it, it, the, it, when you speak about project base, even though these are, you know, short cases, the research phase uh, when done right, really uh, takes the students into a full-blown study phase. Right, they're a little bit different than the typical cases that might lead students to like three different solutions and then the students have to analyze the solutions. We leave that out because they need to use the problem-solving method to guide them through the stakeholder lens and through the difficulties presented in the case as to which alternative solutions to consider um, so that they can do a little bit of uh, problem finding um, as well as kind of coming up with the go forward plan. Great, I have quite a few more questions, so let's get to them too. Um, here 
is a question about the competencies that you laid out a little bit in that slide. So out of the competencies you mentioned, what are the most attained through the method? Can you go back to the competency slide, Justine? Um, you know, I would say the ones, it, it, interestingly enough, I think some of the ones that are hardest for young students to get their mind around, but really are important, especially when they're young and don't have a lot of experience, are the competencies you get from the never assume mindset, first of all, is really being self-aware of yourself and this notion that part of the never assume mindset that we teach the students is in a given situation in real life, you always have to ask yourself if you're part of the problem. And so that uh, just getting it to be hardwired in their head that as they uh, are embedded in a situation that they're a leader in and something's gone wrong and they have to try and fix it, it's just important to look inside themselves as outside. And so this notion of self-awareness, uh, the stakeholder analysis really carries through the interpersonal understanding. And as we've talked to uh, students, they said that's one of the most important things that they come away with is just how do you really listen to other people that are embedded in the situation? How do, you, how do you really get a sense of, of walking in their shoes and seeing the situation through their eyes? So the interpersonal understanding, as well as just the, the values and the mindset of, of you know, not jumping to solutions. Um, and so I, I think really it's some of those never assume um, that are the most important, but clearly, uh, the analytical thinking is another key one, as well as we spend a lot of time on the change leadership and uh, communication skills. So it's hard for me to pick just one, uh, but those are the ones that really rise to the top for me. I don't know what your thoughts are, Justine. Yeah, I would just add one growth area that I see in students is their ability to find to, on information seeking an initiative yeah. where we're not giving them all the answers. They're not selecting from three different way, uh, strategic options. They're having to go find uh, how different people interpret the situation's issues or difficulties and understand how to mitigate through their information seeking, even sometimes conflicts between different professionals that think differently um, and have, di you know, it's common for a student to come to me through the course of a case and say, I talked to the chief legal officer of this organization about the case and she said this, and then I called the emergency room physician and she said this, and they're totally, who should I believe? <laughs> so it's really an awareness of there are different, uh, there are different goals that different people have um, that are professionals and, and are experts. And it's as a leader, how do you um, take those into consideration and, and make decisions? If I could just tell a quick story about that, because this just uh, really hits home. I, I remember in particular, there was one student and that's exactly what had happened to him as he was working through his case. And he agonized over it. He went to every single faculty member. What should I do? What should I do? And we're course to tell him, we can't decide for you what to do. You have to, you know, you have to really get to why they thought that was the right alternative. Um, and, and so it just so happens, it was a year or so ago, I was at a conference and this student, you know, 20 some years later, is one of the key notes be, or one of the key key speakers at at the conference, and so I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, here's one of your former students, and of course you remember when they were just in this dilemma, just you know, beside themselves, like I don't know what to do, you know, and so I said to Muhammad, do you remember that? And he said, oh, it's I remember it like it was yesterday, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, it's just funny how those types of learning stay with the students forever. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Justine. A couple more questions. Um, going to the process and the method, do you recommend a stepwise process to teaching the phases? 
Um, that is, should we have them apply each phase to a case study? If I'm, do you want to take this, Justine? Well, I can just, um, if I understand the question, I think, um, should you split, should you teach the um, method stepwise and maybe teach different cases for different steps? I would teach the method, the whole method through cases, meaning I wouldn't split up the cases. I would say, all right, we're going to use this, this case from the book and uh, we'll have you walk through the define study and act phase and spread that out over the time period you have, whether it's a semester or half a semester. Um, I wouldn't switch up cases in between each phase uh, because I think the students really need to see it from beginning to end. I would agree it helps to go from start to finish. Uh, that being said, I mean, some faculty have thought about, gee, I'd really like to teach a defined phase in the management course and the study and act phase in the strategy course. And, um, you know, I think my advice would be you might want to even get through an abbreviated study and, and act in a management course using one of the first, the quality and operations cases tend to be um, easier for students as well as working professionals to get their hands around. Um, but, but if you, you know, want to do the defined phase in one course, then once they get to the strategy course, I would bring them back to, okay, let's look at the work that was done and then take them through uh, the study and act phases um, in a strategy course. But I think it does really help to go through the whole method and they build on each other. So it's hard to, you can't really do the study phase without having done the defined phase. Similarly, the act phase depends on what came out of your study phase and what came out of your defined phase. Okay, great. I have a question and a couple questions based on um, type of program here. So I'll do them uh, one after the other. What is your experience in teaching this problem solving method to adult learners and or executive MHA, MBA students? Justine, do you want to talk about that. the executive and then I'll talk about kind of special sessions I've run? Sure. Um, I have a good amount of experience teaching this to executives and the way the approach that I take is um, there are a few different ways. The first way is I've chosen a case and I've had um, in our executive program a case competition. And um, it's a good way for in the beginning of um, an executive session where maybe you're on campus or in an intense virtual session to kind of collaborate and get to know one another and also get to know a uh, problem solving method. Um, another way that we've used it is uh, through the capstone and having students who are um, sourcing their own capstone projects in the organization that they're a part of utilize the problem solving method as one tool as they work through their capstone uh, situation and drive to uh, recommendations and maybe testing those recommendations out in the organization to which they're a leader in. We also have a, um, for the case competition in the instructor's manual, there's a sample uh, program or syllabi that you could consider in your executive program. Um, and then lastly, we are going to uh, create a formal problem solving course for the executives um, starting next year that will be more than a symposium or weaving through the capstone. So um, that will be uh, formalized in the curriculum and I'll likely use a combination of cases and a real life issue that they're facing in their organization. This is Sandy. I would just add, uh, when the executive program was first being designed at the University of Minnesota, the folks that were designing it said, well, these are all experienced practitioners. We don't think they'll need this course. And part of what they had to do in their first year was submit the project, a description of the project they were going to do for their capstone 
And as soon as those got turned in, the instructor came to me and said, I think we have a big problem. These students need problem solving. Um, because even with a lot of experience, it didn't mean that they didn't jump to solutions. I mean, there was just a lot of, of convergent thinking that you could see was going on in their project descriptions that, that they, they were just going to implement some solution. They weren't really going to study something. So the moral of the story we learned and having done a couple of, uh, I've done numerous um, mini sessions, if you will, out in organizations as part of their executive development uh, seminars where they bring in external folks is especially around the design and uh, into some of the study phase that it is very useful even for folks with quite a bit of experience uh, because they just have never been made aware of the assumptions that they're bringing as they read a case. It's human nature. You right. have to train your brain not to do that. Thanks, Sandy. Um, we have a few more minutes, so I want to get to the last couple questions here, if I may. Um, where, so on talking to programs and curriculum, where would you start with introducing the method if you're developing a new program, maybe not one that's traditional? You know, I, I think if you can um, get, where we have a problem solving class uh, at the University of Minnesota is second semester of their first year. They've gotten enough intro under their belt that they have enough of an understanding the healthcare system and you then expose them to a case-based course where there are no right answers, that you teach them how to become independent learners um, and get, you know, put structure on unstructured um, messes, basically. Uh, and then it really gets them ready to go out and do a summer residency. So I think if, if you are planning, you know, putting together a curriculum from scratch, I would really encourage, uh, if it's a master's program, get it in their first year because then they can really build on that um, expertise as they do their summer residency and their um, capstone projects. And then uh, similarly, if it's an undergrad program, uh, if they have to do some kind of experience between their, you know, junior and senior year or right after their senior year before they graduate, that somewhere in there you get it into the curriculum. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, there's one last question. Um, does the method and text help reinforce and explain where biases occur throughout? Do you want to take that one, Justine, or do you want me to? Go ahead. Okay, so I would say it, it really comes in a couple of different places. One is right up front, when you do a stakeholder analysis, you really have to listen and pay attention to what all the different people in the process or the organization that are touched by this problem are telling you. Um, and so you may think you know, you know, I, I still remember, and I don't know if the organization did this on purpose, but, um, the way the project was des described to the students is uh, our inventory management system is not working because these nurses just don't push the button on these machines. That's really how it was described to them. Um, and I think that was in part to force the students to, you know, um, realize that they need to find the problem better than that. Um, but that notion of, of really getting outside of of your biases about how you view, view the problem comes up when you first do the stakeholder analysis and then use that to really inform what are the difficulties in the situation to identify the problem areas. The second area where it really comes in, particularly around confirmation bias, is in the study phase of the method. And um, if you remember that decision criteria matrix um, that we laid out, I don't know if you want to go back to that, Justine, where there's the alternatives listed in the rows and the decision criteria listed in the columns. 
we make sure to tell the students, and this is true also in the difficulty. So a difficulty can be someone's opinion as long as it's stated whose it is. It can never be your opinion. So it forces students to really make sure that they are not embedding their opinions into the description of, of the difficulties. Then it comes up again here where when it gets to findings, the findings cannot be your opinions. They can be someone else's opinions as long as it says whose opinion it is and why they think, you know, alternative X is the best alternative. But you have to go out and find evidence for and against all of your alternatives and list that as, you know, findings. Those are facts. And it's not until you've gotten all your data that you're looking at, um, okay, now that I've laid out everything that I've learned, what are my judgments? So your judgments don't come until the end. And that really is to try and avoid uh, confirmation bias. Great, thanks Sandy for going through those um, examples. Justine, if you wanna to go to the last slide, yes. Um, so that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us and please visit us at www.springerpub.com slash problem solving. That is problem, sol problem hyphen solving for more information, including information on how to request a desk copy and preview the content and instructor materials. Or if you wanna purchase the book, uh, please also feel free to send our team questions or comments through email. And uh, thanks again. Uh, please continue to stay safe and well during the pandemic. And thank you to all the healthcare workers, as Sandy mentioned at the beginning as well, out on the front lines and, and really helping supporting uh, those who are on the front lines if you're not a nurse or doctor or um, actually seeing patients. But there's a lot of people on here that are supporting in other ways. So we appreciate that. And um, hope to see you again at another webinar in the future. Take care. Thank you.